Hello, fourth grade, and welcome to Unit 5, Week 2. Let's go ahead and begin with our vocabulary words for this week. Our first word is the word shrivel. If things shrivel, they dry up and they look kind of wrinkled. So when, you, when a grape shrivels up and dries, it becomes a raisin. So think of the shape of a raisin, and it'll give you an idea of what something that is shriveled looks like. <laughs> our second word is the word scoff. Someone who scoffed, made fun of, or mocked someone else. So when you scoff at someone, you're saying, ha, whatever, you know, that person's not, or I'm better than this person, or I'm faster than that person. So when you scoff at someone, you're, you're mocking them, you're making fun of them, you're trying to make yourself sound better than they are. So it's not a friendly thing to do. Next, we have the word topple. <clears throat> Topple means when something falls over or falls down. So if you guys have ever piled up blocks into a tall tower and the blocks fall over, they toppled. Next, we have the word plunging. Plunging means falling quickly or moving downward suddenly. So if you see something falling off of a tree, like a piece of fruit falling off of a tree, you see it plunging to the ground. Or if you've ever seen um, anyone do anything like uh, bungee jumping, they're plunging towards the ground, right? They're moving or they're falling in a very, very quick way. Next, we have the word withered. Withered means something that dried up from lack of water or from heat. So a grape will wither in the sun and then it will become shriveled and turn into a raisin. So withered basically means when something is drying up because there's not enough water and it's really hot out. Our next word is the word prospector. Now this is something that you guys are familiar with from social studies. A prospector is a person who is looking for minerals or gold in an area. So we, when we learned about the gold rush, we learned about the prospectors that were there looking for gold. A settlement is a place where people start living in a new region. So the settlement is when they come to this new area, it's the place that they set up to be where they're going to live. It's where they build their homes and all of their things. And last, we have the word territories. Territories are an area of land that belong to someone or something else. So uh, if you're looking at territories, it's a place that someone owns, but they don't necessarily live there or they're not necessarily over there. So the United States, a lot of the US territories were owned by different parts of Europe way back before they um, gained their, their independence. Moving on to our spelling for this week, we're going to be working on open syllables. So last week we talked about closed syllables. This week we're working on open syllables. Just a quick review. Remember, all syllables have a vowel sound in them. They're a word part. Every word has at least one syllable. And syllables can be opened or closed. Now, the closed ones we talked about last week, they're the ones that end with a consonant and they have a short vowel sound. Open syllables are the opposite. They end with a vowel and they have a long vowel sound. So we can have words that have both open and closed syllables in them if it's a word that has more than one syllable. But remember, open syllables make a long vowel sound and they end with a vowel. Baby or city or fly, those have long vowel sounds and they have a vowel at the end of each one of those syllables. And I listed some examples that we've talked about before of words that have both open and closed syllables like pilot or silent or candy. So anytime it's ending with a consonant, it's a closed syllable. Anytime it's ending with a vowel, it's an open syllable. So a lot of the words that you have here have both. So you have the word famous, radar, razor, vacancy, beside, beyond, defend, delay, demand, prevent, secret, veto, bison, diver, cider, silence, Clover, spoken, stolen, tulip, swallow, plastic, rumbles, request, and sequence. 
So a lot of these words, if you're reading them kind of slowly like I did, you can hear where the vowels, or sorry, where the syllables are. So remember, syllables have a vowel sound in them. All right, let's hop into our ELA and grammar notes for this week. Now we're going to be working on things called homographs. So homographs, remember we did homophones before. Homophones are words that sound the same but are spelled different. Homographs are words that are spelled the same. So homo means same and graph means writing or spelling for, our, for the purposes of this lesson. So homographs are two or more words that have the same spelling, but they have a different meaning and they have different pronunciations. So that means you say them differently and they have a different meaning. Now, usually homonyms have the same spelling and pronunciation, but different meaning. So those are just basically multiple meaning words. You say it the exact same, but it can mean something different depending on the sentence that it's in. But sometimes homonyms are grouped in with homographs. So for the purposes of this lesson, we're going to call them all homographs, but now you know the difference. So our first word is spelled B-O-W. Now you can pronounce this as bow, which means to bend forward at the waist, like when you bow, uh, the, the, you know, prince bowed to the king. Or you can pronounce it as bow, where it means a pair of tied loops, like a bow you put on top of a present or a bow that you make with your shoelaces. Next, we have the word C-L-O-S-E. Now, you can pronounce this as something that is close, which is a which is a verb, right? It, or sorry, it's an adjective. It describes where something is. It is close to you. Or you can pronounce it as close, which is the opposite of open. That's a noun. Our next example is this word that's spelled M-I-N-U-T-E. Now, you may want to read this initially as minute, right? Minute, a minute is 60 seconds. Or you can pronounce it as minute, which means something that is very small, like a minute amount of you know, whatever you're working with, the pie. Next, we have T-E-A-R. You can pronounce this as tear, which means like to rip something, like I be careful not to tear your paper. Or you can pronounce it as tear, which means you know the water that comes from your eyes if you're crying. We have live and live. So live means to be a resident in a place, right? Short vowel sound, live. Or you can say live, which means to be alive, which is pronounced live, the long vowel sound, something that is living. Next, we have this word, which is spelled W-O-U-N-D. You can pronounce it as wound, like I wound up my toy or I wound up my clock, means to turn the past tense of the word wind. Or you can pronounce it as wound, which means an injury. Like I got a wound on my knee. I scraped my knee. I got a wound there. And the last example I'm going to give you is spelled N-U-M-B-E-R. You guys will want to read this as number, which means a numeral, right? One, two, three, those are all numbers. But it can also be pronounced number which means more numb. So when you can't feel something, so think about um, if you're sitting a certain way and your foot falls asleep and goes numb, right? If it becomes more numb, if you sit there even longer, it's number, not number. You don't pronounce the B the second time around. So these are our homographs. They are a lot of fun to work with. You use your context clues to be able to figure out how to pronounce it and which meaning it has. So read the sentence that it's in and that can usually help you figure that out. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about are things called articles. Articles are a kind of adjective that come right before the noun that they're describing. Now, they don't sound like your regular articles, but you'll recognize them because you use them in sentences all the time. The articles that we're going to talk about are the words a, an, and the. So we use them a little bit differently. So the, when we're talking about the, we're talking about a specific noun, a specific person, place, or thing. So the can be used right before a singular noun or a plural noun. So we watched the kids play. So kids is plural. 
Or I can say, did you eat the cookie? That's a singular noun, cookie is singular. So the comes before either singular or plural nouns and it's talking about a very specific one. A and an are the opposite. A and an talk about a general person, place, or thing, any person, place, or thing. Now, you might be a little confused as to which one to use. So there is a clue for you. There's a rule here. You use A before words that begin with a consonant. I forgot to finish that word. You use A before words that begin with a consonant, and you use an before words that begin with a vowel. So I saw a puppy. This is a singular noun, begins with a consonant letter, right? P is a consonant. So I use a. I picked an apple. So an, I use it before words that start with a vowel. Apple begins with a. And this talks about any apple. I'm not telling you I picked, you know, the Granny Smith apple from the tree. I'm telling you I just picked an apple, any apple, or I saw a puppy. It's not a specific puppy. It's not, I didn't see the puppy that lives next door. It's not a specific one. I saw a puppy, which means any puppy. So the articles are a, an, and the. Now we have another group that are called demonstrative articles. And these kinds of articles show if a related noun is singular or plural, and they tell you if the object that the person is talking about is close to them or far from them. I know you're wondering, what does that mean? So let me tell you what the demonstrative articles are, and then we can go through and explain them. So our demonstrative articles are the words this, that, these, and those. So these four words will show you if you're talking about something that's singular, right? This or that talks about something that is singular or plural. These or those, we're talking about a group of nouns, right? So those show plurals. Now, it also shows you if something is close by. So if I'm talking about something that's next to me, if I'm talking about a book that's next to me, I'm talking about this book. Or if I'm talking about a pile of books that's next to me, I'm saying these books. But if I'm talking about something that's far away, I'm going to say that book one over there, or those books. So that shows you right from the sentence, from reading it, you're able to recognize, am I talking about something that's close by to the speaker? Or I'm talking about something that's far away from the speaker. So this and that talk about singular things. These and those talk about plural things. These, This and these are the things that are close to me, either one thing or multiple things. That and those are things that are far away from me. So these are things that you've used a lot in your writing. So don't panic. I'm just giving you a name for them and giving you the rules that they follow. So come back and visit the notes as much as you need. But a lot of these will be easy for you to follow because it's the way that you already speak and write. It's the way that things are written in the things that you read. Let's hop into our weekly stories. Our first story this week is a tall tale and it is called Apples to Oregon. So tall tales are usually very exaggerated with the characters and the things that happen um, to relay a message. So let's go ahead and read through this one. Genre, tall tale. Genre, tall tale. Essential question. What are some reasons people moved west? Read about a family's journey west with fruit. Apples to Oregon. Being the slightly true narrative of how a brave pioneer father brought apples, peaches, pears, plums, grapes, and cherries, and children across the plains by Deborah Hopkinson. Illustrated by Nancy Carpenter. My daddy loved growing apples, and when he got ready to pull up roots and leave Iowa for Oregon, he couldn't bear to leave his apple trees behind. So daddy built two of the biggest boxes you could ever hope to see. He set them into a sturdy wagon and shoveled in good, wormy dirt. Then he filled every inch with little plants and trees, hundreds of them. Daddy was ready for the most daring adventure in the history of fruit. 
Apples ho, he cried. Along with apples, my daddy took peaches, pears, plums, grapes, and cherries. Oh, and by the way, he took us along too. We all had lots to do on the journey. Each morning, I helped Mama bake biscuits, while Daddy prepared for another long day on the trail. At night, Mama and I tucked in the little ones, then Daddy fiddled lullabies under the stars. Why, I can still hear him crooning to the Gravensteins. Hush, little babies, don't you cry. Mama's gonna bake you in an apple pie. If that apple pie ain't sweet, Daddy's gonna munch you for his own special treat. We rolled along just fine till we came to the Platte River. It was wider than Texas, thicker than Mama's muskrat stew, and muddier than a cowboy's toenails. Just looking at it made my insides shrivel. The riverbank was crowded with folks in prairie schooners trying to get up the nerve to cross. When they saw us and all our little fruit trees fluttering in the breeze, they burst out laughing. Those leaves will be brown as dirt before you hit the plains, declared one old geezer. Plains, scoffed someone else. That nursery wagon won't make it halfway across the river. But Daddy didn't let their talk worry him. He just looked me square in the eye and said, Delicious, I'm gonna need your help. Right then and there, we built a raft for his tiny trees. Then Daddy loaded me and my little sisters and brothers onto the edges. Now, make sure my precious plants don't topple into the water, Daddy warned. Well, we hadn't gone far when that muddy drink started to pull us down. The peaches are plummeting, my sisters shouted. The plums are plunging, boomed my brothers. Don't let my babies go belly up, howled Daddy. I had to think quick. We're too heavy. If we don't go faster, we'll sink. We gotta take our shoes off and kick. And so we kicked. Course, we'd all been raised on apples, and everyone knows young'uns raised on apples are strong, mighty strong. Before you could say Johnny Appleseed, we'd kicked ourselves clear to the other shore. But no sooner had we got every last tree loaded back in the wagon than I spied a foul-looking bunch of clouds stomping round the sun just fit to be tied. The wind began to throw around everything that wasn't lashed down. Our boots, baby Albert's diapers, every pot and pan Mama had, even our own little wagon. Next, hailstones big as plums came hurtling out of the sky. Guard the grapes, protect the peaches, Daddy howled. So we all started tearing off our clothes and holding them over Daddy's darlings. Bonnets, petticoats, trousers, hats, even Daddy's drawers. Stop and check. Visualize. Which words on page 391 help you visualize the action during the storm. Phew! At last the storm passed and Daddy's dainties were safe. After all that excitement, it felt good to hit the trail again. But before long, we came to an endless sandy desert. Now remember, us youngins didn't have our wagon or our boots. In no time, our feet were redder than the poison apple the old witch gave to Snow White. Delicious, this is our toughest challenge, said Daddy, wiping his brow as I followed him on tippy toes. We got to find a water hole or my babies are done for. Sure enough, by noon, the fruit trees began to droop. By three, their itty-bitty tender leaves were getting crispy. By nightfall, Daddy was crying, a handful of dead branches pressed against his heart. I couldn't bear to see my daddy suffer. So early next morning, 
I took off to look for water. But although I searched and searched, I couldn't even find a splash or a puddle. After a while, I got so tuckered out, I plopped down under an old sagebrush. Ouch! I yelled, landing on something hard. But when I saw what it was, I whooped for joy. My very own boot. What's more, it still had some water in it from all those melted hailstones. That was our lucky day, let me tell you. We found every one of Mama's pots and pans spread out across the sand. They all had a few drops of water in them, too. Just enough to get Daddy's trees to the next watering hole before they all keeled over. My, that first sip of water sure tasted good. Even if I did have to wait my turn behind some Baldwin apples. Oh, and I'm pleased to say our wagon and all the boots turned up too. All except one. I reckon that nasty wind blew my left boot clear to the other side of the moon. And if it should happen to drop out of the sky on your head one of these days, I'd sure appreciate your sending it along to me. Well, we kept on going past Courthouse Rock and Chimney Rock and Independence Rock and lots of other rocks that didn't have names. We climbed up rocks and down rocks, and at last we reached the Columbia River. Just a hundred miles to go, declared Daddy. But time was running out. Our little trees had almost drowned in the river, got pounded by hailstones, and got withered by drought. How much more could they take? And now we were set for a showdown with the most ornery varmint of all, Jack Frost. Oh, I'd already spied him sneaking around our campsite, brushing the cottonwoods with his cold white tongue. But I wasn't about to let him get close to my daddy's apples. So that night, I made a big fire and sat by it, waiting for Jack Frost to show himself. Sure enough, as soon as the moon came up, I spotted that old good-for-nothing slinking across the meadow, heading straight for the sweet Junes. I got ready to fight. Jack Frost came at me, turning the ground so cold my toes went numb. But I didn't give up. I grabbed a flaming stick and threw it right at him. Before you could say, Peter Piper picked a peck of pretty pippins, that low-down scoundrel was hightailing it out of there, heading straight for Walla Walla, Washington. Stop and check. Visualize. Which words on page 396 help you visualize the showdown between Delicious and Jack Frost? I'm mighty grateful, Delicious, said Daddy as he scrutinized his sweeties the next morning. Thanks to you, even the sweets stayed snug. We were nice and cozy, too, added Mama, checking the children. Sure enough, all Daddy's trees survived just as if they'd come across the plains in a swanky carriage. We floated them on boats down the mighty Columbia to a pretty place near Portland. Then we planted them in that sweet Oregon dirt at last. Gold was discovered in California not long after, and thousands of people rushed there to seek their fortunes. But not us. We already had our fortune. Those apples, peaches, pears, plums, grapes and cherries made us richer than any prospector. We were happier, too. After all, apples taste a whole lot better than gold. As for my daddy, he was always sweet as a peach. He and Mama lived happily to a ripe old age. Daddy never forgot my brave deeds on the trail. Why, as soon as he sold his first bushel of apples, he bought me the prettiest pair of boots you ever saw. Delicious, said Daddy. You'll always be the apple of my eye. Stop and check. Reread. How did Daddy reward Delicious for her brave deeds? Reread to find the answer. Genre. Expository text. Compare texts. 
Read about the experience of pioneers during the 1800s. Westward Bound Settling the American West The great movement west across the United States did not occur all at once. Instead, this migration took place slowly, mainly in the first half of the 19th century. The surge westward began with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which doubled the size of the United States. This new land extended from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. The United States continued to add territories through various agreements and a war with Mexico. As a result, land became available in the West, Southwest, and Northwest. The government encouraged settlement of this land by giving it away or selling it cheaply. The Reasons Why Many Americans were more than willing to pack up and head west. The East Coast was crowded due to the arrival of immigrants from Europe. Work was hard to find and did not pay well. Many people had factory jobs. This type of work involved long hours and little money. Large families were forced to live together in small spaces. People believed the West offered an opportunity for a better life. Many liked the idea of owning land and becoming farmers. People also moved West for freedom. Slavery was still practiced in the United States during this time. Many escaped slaves headed West, where they had a chance to be free. Other groups of people migrated West so that they could practice their religion freely. For example, large groups of Mormons traveled to Utah for this reason. Finally, the gold rush was a major factor in westward migration. The discovery of gold in 1848 resulted in a mad dash to California. Thousands rushed to California to get rich. Unfortunately, many prospectors learned the hard way that gold was not so easy to find. The Journey West The Journey West was a difficult one. People had to travel thousands of miles across unknown land to reach their destinations. Many rode horses or walked. Families used covered wagons pulled by horses or oxen. They could follow a choice of trails already carved by mountain men. Some chose to take the 900-mile Santa Fe Trail. This led from Missouri down to the Southwest Territories in New Mexico. It followed the Arkansas River before branching into a mountain route and a desert route. The trail ended in Santa Fe between the Pecos and Rio Grande Rivers. Other routes included the 2,000-mile California Trail from Missouri to California and the 1,400-mile Mormon Trail from Illinois to Utah. These trails involved crossing over the Rocky Mountains and the Missouri, Platte, and Green Rivers. The California Trail passed over the dangerous Sierra Nevada Mountains as well. By far, the most heavily traveled route was the Oregon Trail. This 2,000-mile journey took six months to complete. Pioneers traveled over prairies, deserts, mountains, and rivers to reach their destination. Along the way, they passed sandstone landforms, such as Chimney Rock. Independence Rock became one of the most famous landmarks on this trail. It represented the halfway point of the long journey. U.S. Westward Expansion Trails Portland, Sacramento, San Francisco, Santa Fe, Independence, Nauvoo. Key, Yellow Line, Mormon Trail, Red Line, Oregon Trail, Blue Line, Santa Fe Trail, Purple Line, California Trail. The Challenges Ahead Weather was always an important consideration for pioneers. Thunderstorms, snow, wind, and drought were all concerns. The dry heat of the desert and lack of water posed real dangers, especially in the Southwest. Pioneers traveling in the Northwest faced cold and snowy mountain passes. There were other hardships on the trail, too. Pioneers dealt with illness, hunger, exhaustion, and natural dangers such as snake bites. 
people had to work together to ensure that they survived. They formed long wagon trains and traveled the trails in large groups. Still, in other parts of the trails, cool rivers and lakes welcomed them, and open prairies provided the food they needed. Some Native Americans showed great kindness to the pioneers and helped them along their way. The journey to a new land was both dangerous and exciting. It represented the beginning of a new life with new opportunities. For hundreds of thousands of Americans in the 19th century, the reward that awaited them was well worth the risks of the journey. Make connections. Why did pioneers journey west in the 19th century? What was their experience like? How was the pioneer experience similar to the experiences of other people on the move? All right, that takes us to the end of our story in our literature anthology. Let's go ahead and jump into our readers and writers workshop. And we're going to be reading another tall tale called My, Break, My Big Brother Johnny Caw. Genre, tall tale. My Big Brother Johnny Caw. Essential question. What are some reasons people moved west? Read about the Caw family's journey to settle in Kansas. I was just a tadpole of a girl when my family decided to leave the crowded city life behind. My daddy said, There are territories out west with wide open spaces. The Caw family needs room to grow. He was mostly talking about my big brother. At 15, Johnny had grown so tall that when he stretched out in bed at night, his head hung out the front door and his feet hung out the back door, all the way into the chicken coop where the hens laid eggs between his toes. Mama loaded up the wagon with our belongings and Daddy hitched up the oxen. We began to head west. But it wasn't long until Johnny hollered for everybody to stop. We'll never get there with these slow pokes pulling us, Johnny scoffed. He unhitched the team and put one ox on each shoulder. Mind you don't let them topple off, Daddy hollered. Yes, sir, Johnny said. Tadpole can keep an eye on him. He picked me up and set me on top of his head, where I had to hang on to handfuls of Johnny's red hair to keep from falling off. Then Johnny grabbed hold of the hitch and began pulling the wagon. Wake up! He never did have much sense of direction. He pulled that wagon one way, then the other, faster and faster, digging out the biggest gully you ever saw. The next night, a big rain came and filled it up. I hear that now they call that crooked gully the Caw River. Johnny pulled our wagon to a Kansas settlement where people were trying to figure out how to raise crops. Problem is these mountains, one settler said. They are in the way. Johnny said that was no problem. He saw a big cottonwood tree, used a saw to cut it down, and whittled it into a giant scythe. Next, he whacked the mountains off down near the ground, hauled them west, and piled them up in a big row. Today, folks call them the Rocky Mountains. Everybody in Kansas was so happy with the nice flat land that they asked us to stay and homestead with them. We built a sod house and started planting wheat. Now, one summer, it was mighty dry, all of the wheat had started to shrivel up in the field. Our neighbors came and asked for Johnny's assistance. My crop has about withered away to nothing, said one neighbor. Without rain, we're done for. I have got an idea, said Johnny, looking up at some puffy clouds. He grabbed hold of his big hoe and commenced poking holes in the clouds. Down came the rain in buckets, and the wheat was saved. Caw! One morning at the riverbank, Mama was plunging our dirty clothes in the water to get them clean when a prospector rode up. 
He said he was heading to California to find gold. Trouble is, he said, there's not one decent trail between here and there. Mama said, let me talk to my son. Johnny was happy to help. For a week, he hiked back and forth to all kinds of places, dragging his giant bags of wheat everywhere, clearing trails of trees, brush, and boulders. The Gold Rush folks were tickled to find good clear paths that they named the Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, and the Chisholm Trail. I'm sure glad our family ended up in Kansas. Our neighbors tell us that this is a bad place for twisters, but so far we haven't seen one. I can't wait, though. Johnny plans to lasso that twister and ride it like a bucking bronco, and he's promised his little sister a ride. Make connections. Talk about why the Kaw family moved to Kansas. If you could move somewhere new, where would you go? Why? All right, that takes us to the end of our stories for this week. Let's get into our comprehension strategy and skill. <clears throat> now, both of these we've talked about before, but to review, when you visualize something and you're imagining it, you're taking the details and the words that the author provided you with in the story, and you're using those to construct or build a picture in your head of what's going on. And cause and effect we've covered multiple times as well. A cause is a thing that happens and the effect is what happens because of it. So it, uh, the cause makes something else happen. The something else that happens, we call the effect. Visualize. When you visualize, you use descriptive details from the story to picture what is happening. As you read my big brother, Johnny Caw, visualize the characters and key events to help you understand, enjoy, and remember the story. Find text evidence. In the second paragraph on page 325, I read a description of how tall Johnny Caw is. This really helps me to visualize him. He was mostly talking about my big brother. At 15, Johnny had grown so tall that when he stretched out in bed at night, his head hung out the front door and his feet hung out the back door, all the way into the chicken coop where the hens laid eggs between his toes. I can picture Johnny's head hanging out the front door and his feet out the back door. This helps me understand how big Johnny is. Cause and Effect A cause is an event or action that makes something happen. An effect is what happens because of the event or action. Identifying the causes and effects in My Big Brother Johnny Caw can help you understand the sequence of story events. Find text evidence. As I reread page 325 of My Big Brother Johnny Caw, I can look for important cause and effect relationships. This will help me better understand the plot of the story. Graphic Organizer Cause Effect Cause Johnny is extremely tall Effect The cause decide to move west for more room Cause Johnny thinks the oxen are moving too slowly Effect Johnny pulls the wagon himself Tall Tale my big brother Johnny Caw is a tall tale. A tall tale is a type of folk tale. Features a larger than life hero. Includes hyperbole. Okay, and I'm going to pause there for just a second and explain what a hyperbole is. A hyperbole is when you're making a really big exaggeration about something. So if you said, I'm so hungry I could eat a bear. You can't actually eat a bear. That's a hyperbole, right? You're exaggerating to draw the person's attention to what you're saying, right? You want them to realize how hungry you are. So you would say something like that. So when we have stories that, that include hyperbole, they're including these huge exaggerations, 
just kind of for dramatic effect, just to kind of draw your attention to the story and make that thing seem larger than life. Find text evidence. My big brother Johnny Caw is a tall tale. Johnny Caw is a larger than life character. The story includes examples of hyperbole, such as when the narrator describes her brother. Hyperbole is the use of exaggeration for emphasis. The detail that Johnny is so tall that his head hangs out the front door and his feet reach out the back door to the chicken coop emphasizes Johnny's larger than life qualities. Homographs. Homographs are words that are spelled the same, but have different meanings and origins. Use context clues to figure out the meanings of the homographs in the story, My Big Brother Johnny Caw. Find text evidence. When I read the word head in the second and third paragraphs on page 325, I can tell it is a homograph. Both words are spelled the same, but have different meanings. I will use context clues to figure out the meanings. At 15, Johnny had grown so tall that when he stretched out in bed at night, his head hung out the front door. We began to head west, but it wasn't long until Johnny hollered for everybody to stop. So here you can see examples of homographs. We have the word head. So head can either mean to go in a direction or it can mean a body part. So depending on the sentence that it's being used in and by using your context clues, using the words that are around it, it helps you figure out which meaning the author meant when he wrote that. So that takes us to the end of our notes for this week. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing day. Take care, fourth grade. Bye-bye.